we are unpacking the mass now we're trans transitioning from our rosary time which we do every day at five central into our weekly unpacking the mass and what that's all about for those of you that are brand new with us is <clears throat> we're going to take a look at the readings from the mass today and just begin to unpack them a little bit so i invite you guys that are here live in the uh in the chat to go ahead and, and uh, if you have questions about anything, just throw them out there and I'll see if I can, if I can deal with them. And as always, thanks for liking this video. <clears throat> thanks for subscribing to the channel and uh, sharing the videos. That's a big help to us. So we're going to begin by first taking a look at <clears throat> the readings from Acts chapter 2. That's where we're going to begin today. Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47, is an amazing part, portion of Scripture that really talks about the activity of the early church. And not just the activity like, oh, well, they had a bake sale, and they played a game, and they did, but no, the, the spiritual activity, and, and what their motivating factor was for existing, like what their mission was. And we know this because of the first words that are used in describing it. It says, they devoted themselves to the teaching of the apostles and to the communal life and to the breaking of bread and to prayers. Okay, so first of all, we're going to walk through this kind of not line by line, but thought by thought. <clears throat> they devoted themselves. Now, let's talk about that for a minute. If you're really going to want to experience the fullness of the Christian faith, Okay, which we all talk about as Catholics, we have the fullness of the faith. I will say it this way, we might, we might not. Now, that's not a knock against Catholicism, that's a knock against us, okay? Because within Catholicism is the fullness of the faith, no doubt about it. But do we possess that? Do we take hold of it? Or do we find ourselves picking and choosing and deciding which parts of our faith we want to believe in and accept into our lives and then reject the other parts of our faith? See, we make a big mistake, friends, if we say that, well, just because we're Catholic, then we've got the, full, the fullness of the faith. I don't know that we can say that. That's a question that each of us has to ask ourselves. That's why we're to every single day when we go to Mass, every time we go to Mass before we receive communion, we're called to examine ourselves to see if we're in the faith. And that's what being devoted means. It means that that's the most important thing to us. And that's exactly what was going on in the early Christian community, in the early church. They were definitely devoted. Um, and that their devotion is the key to what happens. So I know people want to say things like, oh, if only we could get back to what was happening in the early church and why aren't there miracles now like there were back then? And why are all these signs and wonders done? Like, look, let's continue reading here. It says, all came upon everyone and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Okay, so there's a connection here and you have to make sure you don't miss that connection. <clears throat> it's not... They went to church twice a year, or they gathered together with the apostles when they felt like it, or when it was convenient to them, and they sort of liked some of the things that the apostles said, but some of them that they, you know, they, they didn't like as much. And there were all these miracles. No, it doesn't say that. It says that their devotion to the faith was the precursor to this to this amazing experience. So what I want to throw out is this, okay? I want to I want to throw this out, okay? Our level of devotion to our faith is going to set the stage for the things we experience with it. You know, I used to run into people all the time when I was a pastor <clears throat> who would run into me and they would say things like, "Oh, hey, Pastor Keith, um yeah, I haven't made it to church in a while, and uh, you know, we, um, you know, we just tried the whole church thing, and it just wasn't feeding us. You ever hear this? It just, it just wasn't, wasn't doing it for me. And and you know, I just, whoops, I just, uh, I don't know, I just got burned out on it because it wasn't really working for me. And they would say that to me like it was almost sort of like the fault of the church. And I guess I, I, I had two questions that 
that I would ask people when they would say that to me. Question number one, I would say, are you in like a small group? Are you in some kind of fellowship group where you, where you are being connected with people? That was number one. And almost always it was no. And then number two, and this wasn't like a, a, a uh, self-serving thing. My question to them was, are you giving to the church? And they were like, that's none of your business, you know? And I'd say, well, I'm just, you don't have to tell me how much. I'm just saying like, is that a huge part of what you do? And a lot of times it wasn't. And here's the thing. When we allow ourselves to be in fellowship and close community with people, and we invest ourselves financially in, in, our, in our faith, you can pretty much guarantee that that's going to cause us to be devoted to it. And that's exactly what was going on in the early church. And it says, all who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their property and possessions and divide them among all according to each one's need. Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple area and to breaking bread in their homes. They ate their meals with exultation and sincerity of heart, praising God and enjoying favor with all people. And every day the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Pretty awesome, isn't it? Uh, so I'm looking through some of your, your comments here, and uh, we're, we're going to take a look at, at a few of these things. If you have questions, okay, Kathy says, Jesus says, receive the Holy Spirit. I thought the apostles didn't receive the Holy Spirit until Pentecost. Okay, uh, we're going to talk about that when we get into John, okay? Um, the, you know, receiving the Holy Spirit, maybe I'm going to talk about it right now. Receiving the Holy Spirit isn't like a one-time thing, okay? There's, 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 there's repeated instances where the Holy Spirit can come to us. So it isn't like it happens, like where that event happens once and we're done. The reception of the Holy Spirit in at the end of John, where Jesus says, breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit, that is a different type of ministry that the Holy Spirit is infusing into them versus the one that happens in Pentecost. So um, different, different type of context, but, you know, they receive the Holy Spirit from Jesus, and yes, there again in Pentecost, but with a little bit different, a little bit different sense of that. Okay, so this is what's going on in the Book of Acts. This amazing fellowship and community. Now, I could just sit here all day and talk about this. So, but I'm not going to. Um, we always want to talk about evangelization. How do we reach out to people? How do we bring more people into our church? How do we stop people from leaving the church? How all of this stuff? You want to know the answer? It's right there in Acts chapter. Two, the way that churches grow typically is not through, um, you know, like marketing strategies where we try to come up with a way that we can make our church more attractive to outsiders through things that we can do to appeal to their preferences. I know we want to think that, okay? A lot, well, maybe I shouldn't speak for you guys. I used to feel like that a lot when I was working in the church world and especially in youth ministry, you know, trying to design these experiences and create these environments that would be attractive to, to non-church people, because it was all about how do we, you know, how do we get people to come in? But here's the thing that we have to remember. The early church didn't grow by trying to replicate things that were happening in the culture around it. And then when people came for that, then sort of like, you know, a bait and switch thing where it's like, oh, we, we, we know you came for this. Now here's Jesus. And, you know, that's a lot of what evangelism can be sometimes when it comes to what happens in churches. You know, we can, we can, you know, definitely go through this experience where we try to like, oh, how do we make things better? And oftentimes what we do is we just wind up trying to address complaints, don't we? <clears throat> Lori is saying, remind others about your videos on the Acts of the Apostles. Yes, on my channel, there is a series with Father Mark Goring and I where we walk through the book of Acts, uh, basically chapter by chapter. Go subscribe to my YouTube channel. There's a playlist, and you can check those out. We've got two more to make. Hopefully, we're going to make one next week. Uh, thanks for rem the, the reminder, Lori. So, really, what we need to be seeing here is what's worked in history. And what's worked in the early church wasn't this idea of, hey, let's try to appeal to the outside world with cool stuff. It was, let's be transformational and let God do his will in us. And then that in and of itself, the Holy Spirit will draw people in 
to a community that's on fire. Let me tell you something, friends. Nobody wants to come to your church if the people that are a part of that church have no Holy Spirit fire or no life transformation. If everyone sitting in the church is like a bump on a log and isn't really practicing the faith or living the faith out, then why in the world would anybody want to devote themselves to that? Okay, I'm not talking about what the church teaches. I'm not talking about the sacraments. Okay, I'm talking about the experience that happens when people just basically go through the motions and ignore the power of what's really happening there. Okay, that doesn't motivate anyone to want to give their life to Christ and want to be devoted to the church and to Christ. What we'll do that, though, is when people like you and people like me, when we devote ourselves to the breaking of bread, right, Holy Eucharist, and to the apostles' teaching, okay, the word and the, the, you know, it's the liturgy of the word and the liturgy of the sacrament, right? It's, it's, they're both right there in Acts chapter 2. How about this? How about if Catholics everywhere in our parishes we said we are going to be so devoted to our faith and to one another that anyone who comes in and sees this is going to be like, what is going on in there? And they're going to want to be a part of that. If we don't really have any fire for it or passion for it, we can't expect them to either. Okay. So this is powerful stuff to be thinking about. All right. Um, quality over quantity. A- amen. You get both. See, here's the thing. Quality and quantity, because it says that every day the Lord added to their numbers, but you've got to start with the quality, okay? We don't start with the quantity, we start with the quality, and then the Lord adds the quantity. That's huge, huge, awesome stuff, right? All right. Um, Jello Jenna 6 says, before I was a Christian, people would try to evangelize that way, and I would get sad because it was like they cared more about their numbers than me. <clears throat> <sighs> yep, I get it. I get that, 100%. <clears throat> You know, it's not about numbers. It's about souls. It's about souls. And that's what we got to remember, right? That's what we got to remember. <clears throat> so let's keep going. Okay. I, I, man, your comments are awesome. People start to wish for the external acts and forget about the miracle that happens on the inside. This is Fernando in, in the silence, but we need to show and testify the happiness from Jesus. Absolutely. You know, again, your faith is going to bubble out of you and to the world. We minister from this, we're channels of grace and it overflows out of us. But if we're not devoted, then what is there flowing out of us? Psalm 118, we're into the Psalms, okay? Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love is everlasting. Let the house of Israel say his mercy endures forever. All right, love talking about divine mercy Uh, In the mercy Psalms here, let the house of Aaron say his mercy endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say his mercy endures forever. Awesome stuff, right? Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love is everlasting. I was hard pressed and was falling, but the Lord helped me. Boy, that's a picture of mercy, isn't it right there? Man, hard pressed, fallen, but God rescued me. He helps me. He does that because of his great mercy. My strength and my courage is the Lord, and he has been my Savior. The joyful shout of victory in the tents of the just. Give give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love is everlasting. We need to say that every day, don't we? That's awesome. The stone which the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. By the Lord has this been done. It is wonderful in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love is everlasting. What an amazing worship song that is. That's powerful stuff, isn't it? His love is everlasting. He is good. We give thanks. It doesn't matter how bad things are around us, right? It doesn't matter. What matters is the goodness of God and his love is everlasting. All right. You guys ready to rock some Peter? First Peter. Okay. We're going to look at this. I love this reading, by the way, you guys. I should keep, uh, keep my eyes on your comments here. Um, okay. Yeah. I don't know what to say sometimes because I just want to, I just look at your comments and I just go, you guys are awesome. You know, Steve says the very worst thing that, that Catholicism can do is try to align with the world. Our purpose in some ways, hold up a mirror to ourselves and the world and keep the teaching from our traditions and doctrine. Yeah. I, you know, I think that's pretty interesting, isn't it? Because what does Catholicism get accused of doing of taking pagan cultures and 
mixing them with Christianity, right? We get accused of that all the time. People are all like, you know, you Catholics, you, it's just paganism, you know. But oftentimes, that's that those comments are made by Protestants who are literally taking the practices of the world and bringing them into their churches every Sunday and trying to make their churches look more like the world. Okay. Now I I don't want to beat up on anybody and I'm not here to like sling mud on anybody. I love contemporary worship music. I love all that stuff too, but I know what I'm talking about. Okay. I used to do this all the time and, but I can tell you this, my, my intent, and I give everybody the benefit of the doubt. My desire was, was to win souls to Christ. It wasn't like I was trying to just, you know, trick people or whatever. I was trying to win souls to Christ, but yet I would get constantly frustrated when people would come into the church, especially students would come into the youth ministry to the church and they get all fired up about, oh, this is awesome. And then eventually, you know, I'd preach to them. I'd bring the fire of God down. I'd preach to them, try to get them saved or whatever. And maybe they would, maybe they wouldn't. But then what would happen? Eventually they'd be kind of like, eh, all right, I'm bored of this. And you know, <clears throat> what else is going on I can do tonight or whatever. It used to frustrate me so much, you guys. And when I became Catholic, like I wondered, how was I going to be able to deal with that? How was I going to be able to deal with going into these old churches? Because the church I go to is old with traditional worship music and absolutely no regard for what is entertaining or um, culturally relevant from that, from an aesthetic standpoint, zero regard for that. And I wondered at first, like, how was I going to handle that? Some of you converts, you know what I'm talking about, right? But what happened to me was that I started to think and I began to realize, like I, I felt this power that to me transcended this, this desire that I had for cultural relevance or for some sort of entertainment or emotional response. Now, don't get me wrong. I was very emotional in mass. It was just weird though, because it wasn't emotion that came from like, you know, a touching song or something like that, or something that was intended to like, you know, excite me. I was emotional because I felt the communion of saints. And I felt the presence of Jesus in a way that transcended any of the things going on with my senses. You know, that's what, tra you know, transubstantiation means, you know, what we believe about the, what happens at the moment of consecration when the, 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 the host is, is transformed into the body of Christ through this, this, this term we use transubstantiation literally means that the substance changes, but that the accidents remain. Now, that, that, that's a way that we don't really speak is accidents. But what it means is that according to our senses, that which we perceive with our senses hasn't changed, but there's something deeper than what we perceive with our senses. Amen. And that is what has changed. And I didn't just experience that from a, a, uh, <clears throat> like a theological standpoint. I experienced it in the depth of my soul when I would go into the church and we would say this creed that was, you know, from the Council of Nicaea. And we would talk about these saints that were hundreds and more than a thousand years old. And the, the tradition that we, would, that we would participate in goes back to the apostles. I mean, that's what I'm talking about. <clears throat> that hit me. Thank you so much, Christina, for that super chat. You're very generous. That level of, of, of experience, like once I tapped into that, I was done with trying to make, you know, worshiping God fun and cool and culturally relevant. I was just like, you guys are missing out, man. It's like <clears throat> trying to, you know, take something and make the outside of it look all cool, but not even worry about the inside. And... I found like what was so important <clears throat> and it, it was been a huge blessing. Give me a second here. So I feel like <clears throat> that's the key to all this. Okay. is to recognize the transformational power of <clears throat> being devoted to that, which is transcendent beyond our senses. But at the same, man, I'm getting, I'm, I'm just getting stuck here. I'm sorry. 
At the same time, though, isn't it amazing how in the Mass, the Church gives us all of this, this, now don't hear me wrong here on this, this sensual stuff. I don't mean that from like a, a, you know, erotic way. I mean, sensual as in our senses are being engaged. We have, we hear the bells, we smell the incense, we have beautiful things to look at, we, we are called to receive the Eucharist physically. You know, every one of our, of our senses is engaged when we go to Mass. We're not just sitting there watching something happen, okay? We don't just, we're not the audience, even in the Latin Mass, okay? Especially in the Latin Mass. People go, oh, well, the Latin Mass is dumb. You don't, you're just sitting there watching. You don't even know what's going on. No, dude, look at what's going on. Participate in what's going on. Even more so that it's not in your language. You can, you can participate in that and, and look at all you have to do. If, if, if what you did wasn't important, if you were just there to watch, then why are there so many things that you have to do when you go to the Latin Mass? Why are there so many things? Why do you have to stand, sit, kneel? Why do you have to do all that? Right? <clears throat> it's because it is important. So in the same way, the church engages all of our senses, but yet what is really happening is deeper than that. See, it's the full package, man. That's what's so great, isn't it? It's amazing. All right. Moving on. We haven't even got to the gospel yet. We're still, we have to get, talk about Peter. I said we we're going to get to Peter like 10 minutes ago. Okay, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 through 9. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who in his great mercy gave us a new birth to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you who by the power of God are safeguarded through faith to a salvation that is ready to be revealed in the final time. In this you rejoice, although now for a little while you may have to suffer <clears throat> through various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that is perishable, even though tested by fire, hmm, interesting, may prove to be pray for praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Although you have not seen him, you love him. Jesus talks about that in the gospel in a minute. Even though you do not see him now, yet you believe in him. You rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy as you attain the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. <clears throat> I just got to sit back for a second and digest all that awesomeness. I mean, what is that all about? That is so amazing. And I think about, you know what they said about Peter? Peter. Where did he get this knowledge? He's an uneducated fisherman. Okay? Look at this beautiful reading that we have. A new birth to a living hope. Because of what? Because it says, in his great mercy. This is what we receive. Especially today, now more than ever, the fountain of mercy is opened forth in a powerful way on this day. We receive that mercy. And what does the mercy do for us? It gives us this inheritance. Okay? Now, I love this idea of the inheritance because what does that mean? It means that we're part of the family. And is an inheritance earned or is an inheritance given? You know, you might say at first, well, no, it's definitely not earned because <clears throat> you don't work for an inheritance, so to speak. But what do you do? You remain in the family, right? You remain in the family because you don't get an inheritance if you're not part of the family, right? You don't get that. You got to be part of the family, but if you are, you get the inheritance. So really the way that we receive the inheritance through the mercy of God, we've been born of water and spirit. As Jesus said, this new birth, Peter's talking about <clears> to <throat> our living hope. Our hope's not in some dead dude. Our hope is not in trying to keep the rules the right way. Okay. Our hope is not in, well, my parents are Christian, so I guess I'm a Christian too. And guess what, friends? Our hope is not, well, I was, I was baptized Catholic, so I guess that means I'm in the club. No. It means that you were baptized into the church, but what does that mean about how you're doing now? Right? This new birth through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead gives you this inheritance, right? But you got to stay in the family. It's kept in heaven for you, right? Love it. Okay, let's keep going here. Thank you so much, Myron Mercado, for the uh, super chat. I appreciate that. <clears throat> now, 
yeah, we'll have to suffer through some trials, okay? We'll have to do that. Peter never said, oh, welcome to your best life now as a member of the Christian community. Everything's going to be great. Everything's going to be easy. It's going to be free. You're going to have a great time. It's going to be awesome. No. He says, you're going to have to suffer a little bit here, right? Various trials. But guess what? Those trials, even in those trials, there's a purpose. So that the genuineness of your faith, which is more precious than gold that is perishable, may prove to be for praise and glory and honor. Amen. Amen. We've got to be, we've got to be in love with Jesus and recognizing that in our trials, our faith gets tested. I hope that you're experiencing that in this quarantine and pandemic time. I hope that what you're experiencing isn't, isn't just a meaningless trial. I hope it is a purifying trial. I hope that what you're experiencing is helping refine you and making you more like Jesus. And guess what? That's a choice that you have to make, isn't it? We each get to choose how that goes down in our own lives. We can walk through the exact same circumstances, friends, and some of us can choose just to bellyache about it and blame God and, and, and woe is me and all this kind of stuff. And we are not purified. We get nowhere with it. Others of us can go through the same circumstance, maybe even a worse circumstance, and find ourselves being refined and purified, right? What's that connected to? Keep reading. Because the love of Jesus that you have, even though you haven't seen him. Oh, what? Yeah. The more you love Jesus, the more that is the driving force in your life. And the more that that helps you conform to his likeness, the more that the suffering you go through purifies you. It's this incredible thing, you guys. And what I love about it is that it's not based on like your ability to huff and puff and, you know, oh, I'm going to be righteous. I'm going to, it isn't that. It's, it's, it's about loving Jesus. And you might say, wait a minute, are you telling me I don't have to do anything? Are you telling me that, I, that, I, don't, that you know, I don't have to turn from my sin? I just love Jesus and oh yeah, I love Jesus. <clears throat> well, yeah, I kind of am. Because here's the deal, friends. If you really love Jesus, if you really love Jesus, then you're going to find that because you love Jesus, those things that, that are required by him come natural to you. Those things that he calls you into, that righteousness that he calls you into, that repentance from sin that he calls you into, you're going to be like, well, duh, I don't want to do that. I don't want to sin. Why would I want to turn my back on Jesus to go do this other stupid thing? Because I love Jesus more than anything. You see, it's all about that, friends. It's all about your heart's desire and the love that you have. You are going to live your life according to that which you desire most. So do you desire Jesus the most? You can't unless you love him. And that's why Peter says that. And that's why Jesus talks about that. Okay, you guys ready to get down here? I should, I should look into... Uh, to uh, some of your comments. I'm sorry, you guys. I'm sort of being one-sided here. Let's look into some of your comments. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Doodle noodle. All true wisdom comes from God. Amen. That's awesome. Um, it, it does. I, I used to have a philosophy professor who said that all truth is God's truth. That's pretty cool. Same kind of thing that you're saying. All wisdom comes from God. You know, without the without without faith in God, you know, we're fools, right? The fool says in his heart, there is no God. Ooh, I like this quote, Naomi, from uh, Chesterton. Let your religion be less of a theory and more of a love affair. Man, I tell you, that's got to be it. That's, that's hardcore right there. I love that. Thank you for that quote, Naomi. That's awesome. Because if, if we definitely... Okay, I see other people are giving you props for that. If, if we don't love Jesus, man... We're never going to make it as Christians. And you know what? That's the thing. You sort of see like what happens when you, you've, I know that you've met Christians. I know you've met Catholics who are, you know, pretty hardcore Catholics, but don't love Jesus. 
They hate Jesus. And what you go, what are you talking about? They hate Jesus. What I mean is this, they're, they're like, you know, it's, they're grouchy all the time. And they're just like, you know, doing everything they can do. And all they want to do is put everybody else down. And all they want to do is fight with people and, and be grouchy. You see them in here sometimes in the chat and you, you see them sometimes in comments, you know, we're just like, oh, you didn't do this right. And you didn't do that right. And, and, and God's mad at you. And all, you know, that's not loving Jesus. That's more like, oh, I can't stand him. It's weird. It's a weird dynamic, right? It's a weird dynamic. Okay, let's keep looking here. Oh, hey, Louise Bonetti says we need to bring Keith Nestor to Brazil to preach. I am with Brazil is like one of my top five places in the world I want to go. So let's make that happen, my friends. I'll come to Brazil. I would love to. Okay. Um, ooh, I like this. We can walk over crushed glass for the one we love. The yoke becomes easy with love of him. Amen. I mean, think about what you do for your kids or your family members that you love. You do anything for them. So we talk about. And there's the bottom line right there, doodle noodle. Jesus said, if you love me, you will follow my commandments. Man, that's it. If you love me, you will follow my commandments. Now, there's two ways you can take that. You can take it in a threatening way. Hey, you better do what I say. If you love me, you'll do what I say. I don't think that's how Jesus meant that at all. I think what Jesus meant was, no, if you love me, you'll, you just will. It's like, it's like you can't disconnect those two things from happening. It's not a threat. I think sometimes we think it is and we treat it like it is. Well, if you really love God, you'll do this. <clears throat> well, I think when we have that conversation, we're focused more on the do this than the loving God, right? Because usually like some people say, we're trying to get, get somebody to do something and you say to them, look, you should really do this. Well, if you love Jesus, you would like it's some guilt trip or something. I don't think that's how Jesus meant it. I think Jesus is inviting us into a loving relationship with him. And he's saying, look, all of the stuff that you're so hung up on as far as do I have to do this? Do I have to do that? Just don't even worry about it. Just love me. And if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. You get the difference? There's, well, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And then there's, hey, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Now you might be, what are you talking about, Keith? That's just weird. Think about it. Think about our Lord for a second. Did he spend a lot of time harping on commandments? Like the Pharisees were always doing and the Sadducees were always doing. They were the ones always harping on him about the commandments. Well, what about this? And what about that? And which one's the greatest? And what about, and, and what was his answer? <clears throat> you know it. His answer was love the Lord, your God. With all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength. And then love your neighbor as yourself. That's where he begins and ends. We get too hung up on all this other stuff. <clears throat> all these debates. All these issues. All this nitpicking. Friends, we must focus on love. And if what we're doing doesn't come across in a loving way or it isn't birthed from a place of love... And I, I question whether it's really connected to Jesus. It's tough, you know, because we want to get so hung up on all the, all the stuff that doesn't matter. And we want to forget that which matters most. Okay. So let's keep going here. All right. Um, <laughs> love the grouchy face. That's funny. Okay. We have, we have to give our totality to Jesus because he's the very essence of our being, Mary says. I love that. Yeah. Okay, you guys. Um, oh, dude, where was the guy who said a minute ago, he said, how do I join the Catholic Church in the midst of this pandemic? I, I know I saw that in here. Sorry for um, letting that one pass, pass me by here. I, I did see that. Um, okay. I think it was, well, I'm not going to say who it was because I can't see it anymore. You know who you are. How do you join the church, right? Okay, I think it's a guy named Michael. How, how do you do this? Okay, this is a weird time. Obviously, contact your, your local, some, some local priest. Now, I've heard various things from various people about, um, well, my priest isn't getting back to me or this or that. Here's the deal. If, if the person that you're trying to get a hold of isn't getting back to you, keep trying somebody else then. You know, don't give up. You're going to have to fight for it, especially in these times of pandemic, and really work for that. And I know that might sound discouraging, 
And I wish that it wasn't so. I wish that you could find a way into the church in an easier way right now. It's just difficult because of these trying times. And again, I don't speak for the church. I don't speak authoritatively in that regard. But I'll tell you what. I believe that God knows your heart more than anything. Wow. Solus. God bless you, brother. Thank you so much. Look at that. What a, what a generous guy. Um, man, you're amazing, dude. By the way, did you guys see what he said yesterday about driving six hours to go to confession? Three hours one way, three hours the other way? And I'm not saying that to like puff him up because that's not his heart. But that's love right there. <clears throat> Thank you, brother. I appreciate that. That's love. That's hardcore love right there to drive that far to receive reconciliation. Michael, God knows your heart. He knows your desire is to be in his church. And I believe that he will get you there. Okay. I believe he's going to open up a way. He's going to make it happen, but don't quit. Don't give up. Don't, don't let some, some priest who doesn't call you back. Stop you. <clears throat> Find a way, make it happen. Um, I don't know where you live. Maybe you already said that, but um, I think you're in, did you say you're in Ireland? Holy cow. Anyway, let's find a way. Somebody knows where he lives. Let's get a hold of somebody. Let's make this thing happen. And uh, man, I tell you what, my heart goes out to you because there's nothing like being in the church. Do what you can. Okay. Keep, keep fighting for it. Um, yeah. Amen. Okay. Wow. Let's go to the gospel, okay? Man, we've been doing this for almost 40 minutes. We haven't even got to the gospel reading. John 20. How much do you guys love the gospel of John? I love the gospel of John. It's incredible. John 20. There's some, there's some amazing stuff in here. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the doors were locked, where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. Now, remember this. Jesus had already appeared to the women. He had appeared on the road to Emmaus. He had appeared to some other people, right? Now he comes a week later and he appears to his disciples. They're gathered in this room. And what are they doing? They're afraid. Okay. They're locked. The doors are locked, man. Talk about a quarantine, right? They're stuck in there waiting. And here he comes. Stands in their midst. Peace be with you. When he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord, and Jesus said again to them, Peace be with you. I love this. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. Okay? Now, my priest this morning talked about this in his homily, and he was talking about the Greek word there is apostle. And literally, the word, so I send you, he said, the Father has sent me, so I apostle you. So, he, the, Jesus apostles the apostles, sent ones. That's what he means. This is where that comes from. So has as God has sent Jesus, Jesus now sends these guys. And when he had said this, he said, breathe, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit, whose sins you forgive are forgiven them, and whose sins you retain are retained. Now, when people say things like, um, when they say, Well, where in the Bible does this, this confession? You know, people want to throw things at, at the Catholic Church. I've, this is one of the questions I've gotten more than than almost any other from my Protestant friends who wanted to, you know, sling mud at me when I became a Catholic. And this, well, what are you talking about? Confession to it. Where's that in the Bible? And I take them right there, man. I'm like, John chapter 20. And I will show this to them. And it's funny how they they kind of like a whoa. They're not knowing what to do with that. Now, I don't know how you get around it, but people would say things like, well, what is Jesus really doing here? If he's not instituting the sacrament of reconciliation here, if he's not giving the disciples the authority to do this, and people say, oh, well, only God has the authority to forgive sins. No man can forgive my sins. Why should I go to confess my sins to a priest? He doesn't have the authority. to. Oh, well, what does your Bible say? Go read your Bible. What does it say? It, it shows Jesus sending them to do this. I don't know. Why do we complicate things so much? Why do we wrestle with it? I'll tell you what, though. People are missing out. All right? Now, here's the dealio, okay? To use an Uncle Rico phrase, okay? Some of you will get that. I had a guy come up to me one time after a talk I gave, and he said, do you really believe that we need to confess our sins to a priest? And he's like, why would you want to do that? And I looked at him, and I said, 
Why wouldn't you want to do that? Oh, Marie, thank you so much. You're awesome. I said, why wouldn't you want to do that? He's, what do you mean? I'm like, why wouldn't you want to go to confess your sins <clears throat> to a man who's been given authority by Jesus himself to give you Jesus forgiveness? Why wouldn't you, why wouldn't you want that? Like if that were an actual thing where Jesus representative <clears throat> could, could go to you and give you absolution, right? Which is what it's all about. Why wouldn't you want to do that? And he goes, and this guy was a Catholic, right? He was a, he was a Catholic that fell away and he came to one of my talks. I was pretty excited. And he goes, he literally says to me, I never thought of it like that. You know what? I think it's true. A lot of people don't think of it like that. I've never once thought, oh man, I have to go to confession. I really wish I didn't have to do that. Well, sometimes I wish I didn't have to do that because I wish I didn't sin. But I look at it as it's an amazing gift. <clears throat> it's amazing privilege and honor and gift what our Lord does here for us. Whoever sins are forgiven. You forgive are forgiven them. It's powerful. Now, Thomas, we're going to move on. Sorry, I could, I, could, I could stay on this all day long, right? But some of you probably want to go eat dinner or something or go to bed. Um, it's awesome. Thomas apparently wasn't with these guys, right? He wasn't with them. It's a healing sacrament, Lord. You, you are 100% right. I remember my first confession, I felt like I had the weight of the world lifted on me. It's crazy awesome. And I almost always feel like that. I can feel it when, it, when, I, when, I, when I leave. It's amazing. Why would you want to do that? Give me a break. <clears throat> Thomas called Didymus. One of the 12 was not with them when Jesus came. Where the heck was that guy, right? He was, remember, he's the one who's kind of like, like, let us go that we may die with him. That were, you know, in John chapter 11 or whatever. And, and now he's scattered. We don't know what happened to him. But they found him, of course, and. The other disciples said to him, we have seen the Lord, but he said to them, now, now we're going to beat up on Thomas, but I tell you what, I think a lot of us should cut him some slack a little bit. Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger into the nail marks and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now, a week later, his disciples were again inside and Thomas was with them now. Okay, so they got him back. Jesus came, although the doors were locked and stood in their midst and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands and bring your hand and put it into my side and do not be unbelieving, but believe. And that just hit me. Did Jesus scold him? Did Jesus say, no, you know what? You're not going to believe me. Get out. No. He said, okay, Thomas, this is what you need. This is what I'm going to give you. Do not be unbelieving, but believe. Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. Which again, that's what we're to say every time the priest consecrates the host and raises it up. We behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We behold him and we say, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you come to believe because you've seen me? Now we're going back to Peter, okay? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed, okay? Now remember what Peter said. He said, although you have not seen him, you love him. And although you do not see him now, yet you believe in him, you rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy as you attain the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Okay, this is, this is tied together. Isn't the church awesome for giving us these readings? Yeah. Right? See, here's the thing. You and I, we receive from the Lord what we need. Now, I know we say, oh, well, I would believe. Have you ever talked to somebody who's like, I'd believe if Jesus Christ appeared to me in my room, if he did this or did that. But he didn't, so I don't believe. You know what that proves to me? It proves to me, no, you wouldn't have believed even if he did that. Okay? Because guess what? People see miracles all the time and they don't believe. We've all been seeing a lot of stuff on the Shroud of Turin lately. Okay? I'm sorry. But if you look at the Shroud of Turin and you examine 
the evidence of what that is and you've seen the presentations and you've looked at the research and the and the proof of what that is if you can look at that and say i don't believe i don't know what else you could do if you can look into history and see what's happened at places like fatima where our blessed mother did this miracle in front of 70,000 people approximately and you can look at that and you cannot believe if you can see the Tilma in Guadalupe, Mexico, and you can see the miracles that have taken place and the Eucharistic miracles that exist here today, and you can see the bodies of incorruptible saints, and you can see all of these miraculous healings that take place and, and, and all of these things that happen in the world, even today, and not believe, then your problem isn't your eyes. Your problem is your heart. If your problem is really your eyes and what you need to see, I am believing that God will show that to you. But see, our problem isn't our eyes, friends. Our problem is our heart. We just don't want to obey and to submit. We don't want to do it because we don't want God telling us what to do. We don't want to believe that we have to, to, to submit our lives to God, which is stupid. Because what else are we going to submit our lives to? Money? Ourselves? Our own desires? How does that work? Whoever was happy doing that, ultimately. How, what, what kind of joy do you see people that are going through difficulty and, and suffering? You see, what does their money do for them, right? Right? As soon as it's taken away, they're like hopeless. Sometimes it's even hopeless when they have it. Apparently, Thomas needed to see that. He needed that. And, and Jesus gave that to him. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Friends, we're blessed. In some ways, in some ways, we're more blessed than the apostles. Now, hold on a minute before you beat me down on that. <laughs> Here's the deal. I mean, obviously, they're more blessed than us and that they were with the Lord in, in a special way. But you know what? In some ways, we're more blessed than them because we live on the world and we haven't seen Jesus the way they did. And he said, blessed are those who have not seen and believed. That's us, right? Now, what we realize is that as we believe, then we see. It's powerful. It's awesome. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. But these are written that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that through this belief you may have life in his name. That's it, friends. And it all starts with his mercy, which we celebrate today. In his mercy, he's called you into this inheritance, into this hope. In his mercy, he's called you into this loving relationship with him. May we, may we enter into it. And may we, as the early church was, may we be devoted to the breaking of bread, Eucharist, to the teaching of the apostles, the tradition of the church, the word of God. And then may we experience those miracles and may everyone else around us have awe and wonder. And may God continue to add daily to our numbers. Friends, we've got a great thing going here. We've been doing this a month and a day, and I'm so thankful for that. For our Unpacking the Mass, I think this is number three or four, and we're going to continue to do this every Sunday. But again, I want to invite each of you into our rosary group at five o'clock right here on my live stream every single day as we go through it. Take some time and read through these readings. Take some time and meditate on them. Keep praying. Keep loving Jesus more than anything. Okay, I'm going to take just a couple minutes here. And look, yeah, some of you had to go. It's cool. I've been on here for a long time tonight. So, you know, I just, I just like hanging out with you guys, and it's cool. It may not make for a super exciting YouTube video after the fact, but whatever. It's all good. My channel is completely <laughs> changing on me right now. And it is what it is. Um, I'm glad you guys are all here. If any of you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do so. That helps. And like and share the videos. That also helps. Um, 
You guys are doing awesome stuff. I can't believe how many of you hung in here with me the whole time. So I'm going to just close with a prayer and thank again each and every single one of you. And especially for those of you who super chatted me, thank you for your, your financial generosity. That means the world to us right now. We appreciate that so much. If any of you guys want to um, join my my support team, go to patreon.com forward slash Keith Nestor and become a patron. And uh, you can you can jump in on that. Great things are in store. I'll tell you guys more about that later. Um, but let's go ahead and pray right now in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Loving Jesus, you've called us into your family. Because of your great mercy, Lord, we can walk with you. We can behold you. And even though our eyes may not see, Lord, we believe. And our hearts are transformed. And our lives are are just all about loving you. God, we pray that this pandemic we're experiencing in our own circumstances, God, let that purify us. We don't want to just go through a needless suffering. We want to be purified so that we can be made more like you. Give us that hope. And Lord, where we are lacking in faith and belief, grant us mercy that we might believe. Where we're struggling with love, God, overwhelm us with your power. And where we've lacked faith, God, give us mercy and peace. As you said to the disciples, peace be with you. Lord, may we receive that as well. I thank you for each and every one of my brothers and sisters here. I thank you for their hearts, for their love of you and for the love of this group and for the support that they give to to everyone, the least of which is me. I thank you, God, that we have the ability to do what we're doing here, that we can reach out and touch people from all over the world through this live stream. Your word is amazing. And we are so privileged that we can study it together. May it enrich our hearts and bless us. We pray all these things in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, you guys. God bless you. And uh, I'm so excited that you guys are in here. And we'll see you back tomorrow. Everybody keep praying for each other. And uh, let's check back in tomorrow. God bless, guys. Take care.